So here we are, Adam. Um, we've got all the fascinating weapons that we've been discussing in this series, from the muskets all the way through to modern day rifles. Would you like to summarise basically each weapon for us? Yeah, of course. Um, so we, we start off um, here in the in the seventeenth century with with the matchlock, and we've got a really fine example here of of um, the perfection of the flintlock mechanism. Uh, sorry, the uh, the uh, matchlock mechanism. Um, simplified perfection, I like to call it. Really. Uh, it cannot be underestimated how important this is to the evolution of all that we see in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, cumbersome, slow to load, but actually a really, really significant piece of military history. Mm -hmm. And as, as we go on, um, this takes us to the, from, from the 17th century, and we're really now getting into the latter parts of that century and the wider use of things like the doglock here. Mm -hmm. We've got a fine example here of a Queen Anne doglock musket the sword and musket that will be taken into the early um, battles of the 18th century, um, as we mentioned, uh, the Duke of Marlborough and the mm -hmm. famous mm -hmm. Battle of Blenheim. The soldiers, the red coats, then would be armed with this. And clearly, we've got the, the introduction of, of the bayonet now. Um, right. the, the pike is gone, as we discussed, and we, we've now got what will it's beginning to look like the iterations of, of future weapons. Mm -hmm. Going on into that century, arguably one of my favourites has to be the Land Pattern series of um, of muskets. And now it, it should be noted that in each one of these, there's variations on a the theme, and and none more really than, than the Land Pattern. You know, started in the seventeen twenties as the pattern gave us standardisation. Um, it it was uh, shortened several times, and, and in this case, is the short Land Pattern version. Um, really was perfection of the, the um of the flintlock mechanism. So we can see we've gone from a dog lock to um, a flintlock. The flintlock being that ability of a half cock yeah. um which just aided in the safety and the loading. Right. Um making it a far more reliable weapon. And obviously one of the one of the big things we've seen now although it has flint ignition, much like the um the dog lock, we have the introduction of a socket bayonet now. So yeah. You know that idea of being able to still use your weapon system as as a weapon system and and um, and use the bayonet at the same time, great utility, absolute great utility. And this this forged empire, there's no doubt about it. This is the this is the pointy end of the the, the, the expansion of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Fascinating weapon system, and um, I think uh, arguably one of one of history's greatest. Mm -hmm. Um, but then clearly we, we you know this this one hundred twenty years reign almost of, of this style of mm -hmm. um, of weapons as this musket gave rise to you know the uh, the nineteenth century and and as we discussed that absolute surge in mm -hmm. technological capability mm -hmm. um, you know the now we have the percussion cap so no longer the requirement for a flint we're now getting into using that sort of uh, percussion cap system the formula of mercury. Um, to charge a far more reliable, still breech loading, um, sorry, sorry, still muscle loading, um, but now we're using expanding bullets. And this is now, we start the idea of a rifle. Yes. Now, it's, it, should be, it should be noted that we've had rifles in the, in the in English and the British military for, for a long time prior to this, but those were for specialised units. Sure. Because the speed of using a rifle did not lend itself to the style of fighting at the time. So the use of the expanding bullet Essentially introduced um, marksmanship, uh, marksmanship for the British Army. This uh, and where we are today in the um, in the Small Arms School Corps um, collection. You know this was established because of the the accuracy of things like this weapon. I see. So it really cannot be um, underestimated. You know we start to see the development um, of uh, I wouldn't say lighter technologies, but is a, is a lighter weapon still quite long, but still uh, we're, we're suddenly gaining traction. Now, it wasn't long within the century till we start to um, develop into things like this. Now, we had the, 
the Schneider Enfield conversion of this, which was turned it into a breech loader. But the, the first true breech loader of the British Army has to be the Martini Henry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rifle from Zulu fame, um, you know, everyone knows about this. It's, uh, it's an absolute um, classic of a weapon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we utilised the technology at the time of um, a metallic cartridge, mm -hmm. first rolled brass and then, um, and then, uh, then, then drawn brass. Uh, single loading, but absolutely a reliable, stout workhorse mm -hmm. of the British Army. However, as we said, this, the, the, the century is going at alarming pace. The Industrial Revolution is affecting every part of, of life and no more so than in the military. So at the same time, this is coming into core. The idea across Europe is to bring in a repeating rifle, mm -hmm. a rifle that can hold more than one round. Um, and we then get the genesis of what becomes a very famous family of rifles, and that's um, this is the Lee Netford. Mm -hmm. The start of the famous Lee Action Lee magazine. And it has the Metford barrel, the designer. But really, this was this is the grandfather of a very famous lineage of firearms. Mm -hmm. Initially used um, gunpowder as its charge. Um, you know, it was, although not uh, in its final form, absolutely the blueprint for us going into the twentieth century. And you know the UK did in the eighteen late eighteen eighties into the um, early nineteen hundreds. Um, so turn of the century, the SMLE comes in form, and this is a this is a Mark Three. Um, but the the short magazine, the Enfield. Um, so it's taking in again the Lee Action, the Lee magazine. Um, absolutely perfecting on what was a very good weapon. But now we've got the introduction of um, nitrocellulose. So we've we've got rid of. Um, uh, gunpowder. Right, right. So what does that give us? It gives us extra range, extra power, right. and also a lot clearer battlefield with a right. lot less smoke. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a bayonet for this one, but you can see we've we've sort of moved into this kind of sword bayonet style mm -hmm. um, with the pattern nineteen oh seven bayonet there. But again, you know this with this weapon would would go to be uh, a symbol of symbol sorry of not only the UK mm -hmm. but also the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and utilised in various forms across Australia, India, Canada, New Zealand, all using a form of this this rifle. But really, um, you know, the the perfection I suppose you could say of, of this is it has to be the number four, and and that's why I think we had an episode in itself just because of this. Its significance cannot be uh, underrated. It's um it's a lovely simplified design. Um, you know, introduced in nineteen thirty nine, absolutely was the store of British the British forces going into World War Two and into Korea afterwards. A really, really good weapon system, solid now and, and collectors are like these days love these things because they are built to last. Mm. Um, and, and again its platform spawned on many um, it was spawned on the, the number five, the jungle carbine, um, several versions in, in two two long rifle, mm. so training ammunition. Um, and also clearly the the uh, the, the Model Ts, which the, the snipers, and latterly the L forty two snipers. So it really was um, the sort of the chassis, the base for, for many many weapons well into the twentieth century, and still used today in some armies. Mm. But obviously um, times are times are moving on rapidly, um, and we uh, no long as, as soon as we get out of that sort of World War Two Korea, we're, we're deep into the deep into the Cold War, and the adoption of a battle rifle, um, UK's first. Um, uh, self-loading rifle um, on the SLR L1A1 based on the uh, based on the uh, Belgian FN foul um, this weapon system reliable rugged absolute um, workhorse used in numerous conflicts throughout the 20th century and like I say used in various forms by by several armies still today um, goods large caliber weapon but Clearly, times are changing, and as research development took took sort of took pace again, you know, we now come to our um, the final form, which was the adoption of the five five six cartridge, the intermediate cartridge, um, um, in the eighties. After many years of development, um, well, the, the the model that is, and, and we came in the eighties with the the SA eighty as known. Or this is the L L eighty five A two. Um, We've now got the A3 in service, but this one's fitted out for, for a 2010 sort of Afghanistan fit. 
um, really has been the workhorse of the British Army for um, well over what into sort of thirty years now, mm -hmm. and has seen extensive use in the Balkans, um, uh, the uh, the Gulf, uh, and uh, campaigns in Afghanistan, and it remains today. Um, it's a very accurate rifle, a little bit heavy. Mm -hmm. um, I have to carry it several times, but uh, quite a lot myself. Um, but you know, in its form and now in the A3, a very reliable, stout workhorse of the British Army. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the march through almost 400 years of British military history as much as I have. Adam, it's been absolutely riveting. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching, everyone, and we'll see you next time.